can be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. It absolutely will not stop. Ever. Today we're looking at 1984, but not George Orwell's nightmare, but instead Simon N. Goodwin's vision of tax efficiency in the future, with Runaway Robot, from Games Computing Magazine. It's hard to find, however if you go to the lovely website flaxcottage.com, there are a collection of magazines there, as well as BBC ROMs and other oddments and products and books. Well worth a look, have a rummage around, download some stuff, get involved. Runaway Robot was not only the cover game for this issue, it went on to be the mascot for the magazine. There was even a competition where people were meant to write in and give it a name. I couldn't find what the results were though. Let's see what it looks like. After asking how many players, we then move on to Maze Generation, which is the absolute heart of the game. We have sequences of junctions separated by walls, a horizontal or vertical, and it basically does a run of junctions until things join up and does it quite nicely. It takes about 40 seconds to generate a level. There are 30 different levels of complexity. Each one is going to be generated differently, randomly, and you're always guaranteed to have space through it. After filling out the maze of all the circuits, we fill the maze with a number of batteries. We have four seconds to look at the maze and then you'll go up to guide in the robot. Q makes the robot go up, A makes it go down, O is left, P is right. If you leave it alone for too long, he'll bash into a wall. If you take too long to make a decision at a junction, it'll just carry on. Once you hit a wall, it'll just move randomly, but you can take control at any time. It has a certain pace to it. Gather all the batteries on one level. A little jolly tune, and on to the next. Level 2 takes has six batteries to collect. I've edited out the 40 seconds of maze generation. As you see, even in basic, the core gameplay works pretty well. The robot moves at a nice, pleasant speed. There's not a lot of, not a lot of sound, but it moves fast. It's controllable. There's enough speed to be challenging, but not too much speed so it's annoying. And there is strategy. As you proceed up the levels, your energy consumption increases. You lose energy if you collide with a wall, but also every single time you change direction, that will cost you energy. And each level as it goes up, the cost of changing direction increases, as does the complexity of the maze. So something to watch out for. One battery to go here. It's over there. Come on, you can do it, Mr. Robot. And on to level three. Where we have seven batteries to collect. Scattered around. I can see that you need to cut that one on the left and then move around. And it's a long way through. There are a couple of ways through. You're never in a situation where you can't complete the maze. But it can sometimes be there's only one way between one part of the maze and the next. So it does pay to be a little bit cautious. You have four seconds at the start before the robot starts to move, so you have a quick scan. After that, the game just starts moving. But also, while the game is drawing the maze, you can try and work out what's what. Here's level four, where we have eight batteries to collect. There are very simple UDGs. The robot has four different states, moving left, moving right, moving up and down. Moving up and down are the same character. And the battery is a simple little box in magenta. You can't use the screen string attribute to detect user defined graphics. So what the game uses to detect objects is to use attributes. It actually sets the entire screen to white paper, red ink, and then prints the parts of the maze as black and white. The robot is blue and white and batteries are magenta and white. So you can dif- differentiate between an empty square a wall and a battery. Energy is now down to 75. I need to get some batteries. 57. Each time I turn and it's, I'm not doing a good job at turning and that's game over. I've run out of energy with a score of 183. Let's now break into the code 
by saying, no, don't play again. And here's the listing. It is very well written, plenty of comments. The variables have good names, such as more or y or x, which is actually pretty good for coordinates, direction, complexity, that sort of thing. And also in the magazine, it is extensively documented as to what all the lines do and the structure and everything. So it's really rather marvellous. What can we do to make it better? Well, as this game was pointed out to me by the creator himself, Simon N. Goodwin, he said this game would be good for putting through the zip compiler. So let's give that a go. What? Here at the Interplanetary Revenue Service, we pride ourselves on our dedication to innovation. Just putting your tax money to work for you. We've replaced our rather dull mechanics with the finest robots. And, the, the, and they are used to operate our supercomputer, SPAM, the Seven Planets Administrative Machine. Nothing can possibly go wrong. And you will always pay your taxes. Remember, tax offence is a big offence. The Martian income tax records for the last 10 years have been scrambled. What? Anymore. I always like to put the basic program as it stands through the zip compiler first, just to see what comes up. You know it's not going to work, but it's nice to see how many errors you have to deal with. Obviously you can't have strings, variable names are limited to one character only, you can't have data statements and so on. Make a note of all these problems in a handy notepad document as you can see here, because you're going to be doing a lot of work. And at the end of the first run, we find out that there are 298 errors. Stage 1, change all the multiple character variable names into single character variable names. The advantage of the zip compiler system is that you can run the basic program at any time, just to make sure we've got everything all working OK. What I tend to do is take a single variable, change the definition of it to a single character variable, run the program and then spot all the different places where it fails to variable not found. Do make a note of the variable names because you'll find that S3 is a lot less memorable than say X max. You only have 26 variables to play with and you're going to need a bit more than that. However, you can always use single dimension arrays and just, as long as you know what they are, it'll work fine. Doing this repeatedly gets us down to 134 errors, then 97, then finally 57 errors. Compiling takes about 15 minutes. I have cranked up the speed of the emulator, but I'm not recording footage because otherwise it just takes a bit too long. But something you can do repeatedly over and over again without any harm. The program has data statements to define the user-defined graphics. You can just remove these and put these into a simple loader program. That removes another seven errors. We know we can't use in keys, so we use the standard procedure and replace all the standard strings with their code equivalents. Looking at our notes now, we see we now need to tackle the beep situation. Beep is not supported, but Mr. Goodwin's provides a little bit of machine code which lets you access the beep subroutine in the ROM. You need to poke some numbers into memory, change variables at runtime, and you get some little tones. And that gets us down to 13 errors remaining. The last 13 errors are to do with RND. You can't use RND in zip. However, Mr. Goodwin provided a little routine here to get a random-ish number you set Q to 1 plus peak 23692. 23692 is the number of scrolls left before the screen automatically scrolls. You then multiply that number Q by 99 and whatever that system variable is now. Do some maths to it and that'll get you a number between 0 and 100. This is fine. However, when I was using it here, I needed a number between 1 and 4 for a random direction. And I was having all kinds of problems with that because I'm not a particularly good coder. Line 7, 740, 1 plus into Q divided by 33. So that should be 1 plus 0 to 3. And that should work fine. But then when we run the code, we see here, again, I'll ask directions. Oh, subscript wrong. Because somehow we've managed to get it to be 0, which I don't really understand. I also then needed a random number between... 0 and 30, and then between 0 and 20 for position on the screen. So looking here, I've changed the what we peak at from 23692 to 23672. 
2672 is part of the clock. This is the shortest part of the clock, which updates uh, 255 times per second or so. Which seems a bit more random, because when I was trying to recreate random error problems, the position on the screen would affect the random number greatly. Printed at the top of the screen, it worked fine. Go down towards the bottom, and you could suddenly get 102 instead of 100, instead of 100, which is also not ideal. And again, here my numbers aren't quite right. I'm not. I'm trying to turn 100 in, into naught and 30, and that's a little bit tricky. And also, what tends to happen is it's an intermission issue, so it can work fine. It can work absolutely fine. The game work, works fine until you get to a certain level and the random numbers just don't work. I mentioned this to the Mike DX and he mentioned, oh, there's something in the post coming. The actual zip manual by Simon N. Goodwin himself. And in there, the, z the zip routine actually uses 23672, which is what I worked out how to do. As you can see here, 23672 is the clock number instead. So I got the program to compile fine, no errors, and we were able to run it. So we have our code, we randomize user 55072, which is the start of the machine code, start of the machine code, the runnable machine code, and off it runs. How many players? One or two. Oh, and instantly we crash engine out of range. And because we're in machine code, we get no feedback whatsoever. Because zip compiler is integer only. And we're doing all kinds of iffy maths. The user-defined graphics here are all horrible because we use the user-defined graphic area as part of the zip compilation. You can see it's actually looking okay. So it just about works. So it fails randomly, which is never really good. This is the compiled version I've got working. This is the loader. What I've hit do here is clear an area of, of RAM, set up our user-defined graphics, load the machine code and then execute it. And here's it actually running. Choose one or two players. You can tell it's the machine code version because the cursor is solid black. Ask you how much delay you want because machine code version can be rather fast. This is with zero delay, as fast as possible. And that's so fast, it's unplayable. The reason you want to put a delay in, because the compilation takes 15 minutes or so, and even accelerating can take a good five minutes. You're going to be iterating around how far should it be over and over again. This is two and a half thousand delay. And this is more playable, but a little bit too fast, a little bit uncontrollable. This is especially only for the very first level. But maze generation is certainly enormously fast. We have the problem where the game is just itself too fast. Now, my experiments with randomization do indeed insert a bug that was not present in the original code, which I shall come to later on when we move to the Snorkified version. But this is really rather nice. It's just a matter of choosing how fast you want to play it. Let's make it better. Ciao, baby! Hello! Is that Captain Zip? Or the Wax Man? What? What? Turn that music down, I can't off. hear you! We need Captain Zip! No, no, this is not Captain Zip. This is Simon N. Goodwin. But I know the Captain well. Can you get a message to him? An emergency? Tell him to get his ass to Titan! I'll pass the message right on. May God have mercy on us all! Looks like this is a job for Captain Zip. So how indeed can I make it better? Easy wins are adding a sci-fi font thanks to Ben Stagwell. Then I thought, why not add the instructions for the magazine? They are rather nicely written. They give a bit of backstory to the game. You can't have strings in zip compile code though. But what you can do is have strings in memory. So I knock together the little teleprompter type thing we have here. And not only are we printing out individual characters, but also formatting, where the special quote character activates literal mode, where percent topples on and off flash, numbers in the text change the ink colour, underscore makes you an underscore. You can also activate inverse mode as well. We then have a nice loading screen. I scanned in the 
bit of the magazine into ZX Paintbrush. I then loaded that into the Spectrum, added very roughly a Runaway Robot logo, a first attempt, it does the job. And then once it's loaded, it asks, do you want instructions? And here's the teleprompter effect in action. I print a flashing asterisk in front of it. There's the inverse mode, it works quite nicely, nice and fast. And there we're talking about purple storage units or batteries in magenta. Now here's the gameplay. If you notice the magenta character, it's no longer a little box. I wanted it to be originally a cylinder, like a double A battery with a little knob on the top. Unfortunately, eight by eight pixels isn't really enough, but I managed to cope with a little box, a line at the top, line at the bottom, and a plus and a minus symbol, giving the impression of a battery. There's also this, this little tapping noise, which is meant to be a footstep. The idea is whenever we take a step, we open or close the speaker, just to give a sort of tap, 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 tap noise. At the bottom of the screen in yellow background is a number. This is now number two. We are now on level two. I liked the game, but there wasn't a great sense of progression. So what we now do is we now print out the skill level, which is related to the number of batteries you need to collect at the bottom of the screen. Simon M. Goodwin said there were 30 levels of complexity in the code. At the end of the game, we play a little funeral march. And then the game checks to see if you've got a new high score. It's a score attack game, so you get to record your high score using a way of entering code, again given by Simon and Goodwin in the original Starbase program. And if you don't get a high score, it just tells you who the last person was. As it could be a two-player game, where each player plays a level in turn, I made it a bit easy to see who the player was by making player two have a red border and a red robot instead of the blue robot that you would get as normal. And here's an example of a rather nasty bug that I personally introduced, not in the original code, by my pratting around with random numbers. Occasionally, very occasionally, you would collect all the batteries in a level and then you wouldn't go to the next level. And I, I thought, oh, maybe it's generating too many random batteries or something or other. So in the end, I couldn't work it out. So I put some belt and braces coding in a bit of machine code, and it compiled okay as well. So if you hit that situation, you would just then go to one of the top top left or top right corners, as we can see here, and it would do a bit of machine code checks, make the border go cyan, and then go to the next level anyway. But while recording the footage of me showing my little clunch, which I couldn't work it out, I spotted the actual bug. In the bottom left, we have placed a battery. Once the game starts, the robot is placed on top of the battery, but does not collect it. Never, ever, ever put a battery where the robot starts. <laughs> diddly diddly dee! Runaway robots are no match for Captain Zip. Zip, zip it away! As well as adding a little funeral march when you die, I wanted there to be a winning state, which you get after completing 30 levels. It was a little victory tune. But playing music in Zip is a little bit trickier than just using the beat command by the great Dr. Steve Vickers. So I wrote a little program to try and make things a bit easier. And this program, first of all, plays a tune using beep. Then, then plays it using zip, because I've worked out what I needed to poke into the machine code. In order to play a sound, you need to open and close the speaker at a very specific rate per second. That rate being the hertz. The A above middle C is 440 um, cycles per second. You need to work these figures out and stick these into the registers. This is what the magic numbers are. And they're a bit of a faff to work out. The DE register is relatively simple. It is the frequency multiplied by the length in seconds. HL is related to how many T states are involved and it all gets a bit weird. The ZX Spectrum runs at three and a half million hertz. Then you take your frequency, divide that into there, divide it by four, take away the number you first thought of, and that somehow gets put into HL. 
This version tells you what you need to put into each of the register pairs for each note. I wanted a way of taking sheet music and getting these values out easier than just having to enter lots of data statements. So I wrote this little program, it prompts you for the note, it prompts you for the octave and then the duration, and then tells you what D, E and H, L should be. You then take a note of these. Not very efficient, but it just about works. I wanted to be able to play these notes in our zipped program, so I stuck them in the data statements in a loader, and I put them as D, E, H, L pairs, the numbers as they are, not separated out into bytes. And then when you run the code, this in the loader code, it basically reads the data statements and then pokes into memory appropriately. I'm essentially taking copies of Simon N. Goodwin's beat calling routine and using that multiple times to not do it dynamically, but just have a hard-coded value. So the first byte is always going to be 17. Then we load the low bit of the DE value, then the high bit, then the low bit of HL, then the high bit. Then we jump to the beeper routine in the ZX Spectrum ROM, and then it'll automatically return to our machine code. And we do repeat that for both tunes and for as many notes as required. And at the end of it, we have a series of machine code statements stuck in the printer buffer. And let's see them in action. Using my mental powers, I shall control these robots. Left a bit, left, left, forward, forward, stop, reverse, reverse, right, forward, go, go, go! I was lucky enough to get feedback from Simon N. Goodwin himself on an early version of my snorkified runaway robot. It's always polite to give people a look at what you've done, see what they've done. And he made some excellent points. The loading screen said was fine, but the big text was a little bit ransom notey, like, like it was cut from a newspaper. And yeah, that's a fair point. So I had another go at it. I used some of the fonts from Roberto Colombo's chart bank, print them at the bottom of the screen, and then make them larger. And then added some motion lines. So runaway robot, as if it's moving. You can see there well, what I've done on the bottom right, sort of black splodge. And here are the instructions. You can break out of the instructions. And also on the how many players screen, you can just press zero to exit as I've done here, which makes it easy to look at the code. So or if you don't want to exit, you can just press one or two and it actually does checking. In his email to me, he mentioned that the runaway robot was also used in the opening credits to a Magic Micro Mission, a central television program that completely passed me by. And it's excellent. There'll be a link at the end of the video to the first episode. And in that, the runaway robot had actual animation. So before watching Magic Micro Mission, I thought, oh, I'll have a go at animation myself. We had the, four, the three initial frames. And I then created more ones. The robot going forward, I copied the robot, robot going backward, but blanked out two pixels to represent its face. And I moved its legs back and forth. And then showed these to Mr. Goodwin. And he said, yeah, they're pretty good. I like those. So some of the left-right animations are a little bit janky. Certainly, I found that going right gets a bit um, Eric Walker. So we then gave it another go. And I think it's a lot better now. They flow, they flow nicely, and it works quite well. In the backstory to Runaway Robot is the robot careens around, hitting walls, damaging the computers. But you don't see this on the screen and it's not reflected in the gameplay. So what I've done here is whenever you hit a junction, it's replaced with a new UGG of the junction with damage to it. When you hit a wall, you get the uh, pixels appearing, indicating damage. This is a nice visual effect of the havoc your robot's causing, but it also tracks this. The damage you cause is tracked throughout the game. The game gets faster as you go on. Each level, the delay gets reduced, but you also get a bonus for completing a level. So the idea is you can complete the game, but it gets more and more punishing as you proceed. At the end of the game, we tell you you've run out of energy. I've slowed down the funeral march, and you get told which taxpayers have had their records wiped out, which is based on two arrays of 20 entries each. It's great having ideas of what you want to put into a game. At a certain point, though, you're going to run out of space. This is true of classic basic games, even more so of zip compiled games, because you need to have the basic program, the zip compiler, and the machine code which you produce all in memory. Can six up into the loader. I've done quite a lot of that, but that leads to problems as well. By default, there is a pause of one second between entries on the tape 
created by Spectaculator, and you can edit this in Block Editor if you want to. If you're doing lots of processing, this may not be enough. I've done a little test here. What I'm doing is repeatedly loading a font and then change the font to do that and then defining all the UDGs. And I found that you can define all 21 UDGs fine and set the font and that works okay. If you do much more than that, and here I'd start doing some circles, you start to get loading errors where the tape starts playing before you're ready for it to load. With the fonts, this is not the end of the world. If you're trying to load machine code that you're then going to execute, this is going to bite you. So you need to adjust things a bit to see how you process things. I was taking all the instructions, poking them into memory, and that didn't work. It took too long. Instead, I poked the instructions into memory and then saved the bytes directly and noted them as code. I then changed the loader to poke the tunes into memory one at a time, loading some code in between. If you're doing a basic program, you need to do all the loading before you load the basic code, otherwise you can't do any more. If you're loading the machine code zip program, you can load stuff, then do some extra processing after loading the final bit of code before you execute it. That gives it a little bit more leeway. And here is the ultimate Snorkify Dlatch compiled version. This is sped up 10 times. It still only takes three and a half minutes to load. After loading though, the game looked like it had crashed. I put in some little beeps and changed the border colour to give you an idea of that there is actually something going on. You're prompted uh, for one or two players not to exit. You are not prompted for delay or ask for instructions. One of the things I had to chop for space was the whole teleprompter instructions thing and even asking you what the delay was. Delay is now hard coded and it does get faster with time. If you find it's too hard or too easy, you can of course poke it at the address here. The low order byte is first of course. It's set to 5720 just for reference. This is the last level of the compiled version and you can see here all the lovely lovely batteries you've got to collect and hopefully I will see the end of the game but at high levels every mistake you make is punished every wall you collect can't take more damage every every time you turn it has a lot more energy and it's going to be a close one and i've not done it i've run out of energy with a final score of 13485 on the very last level the sales tax pairs of earth are pleased let's now show you what would happen if i had of one Marvellous. You've saved the day once again, Captain Zip. Thanks to you, the good people of the Seven Planets will be paying their taxes once more. How can we ever repay you? No need for thanks. It's enough to know that those robots are doing their duty. Just like all good citizens should. God bless you, Captain Zip. Simon N. Goodwin also suggested a few very simple changes I could make to make the program compatible with the 128k spectrum. There are three areas of this. The first is the machine code. His beep subroutine is at address 23500 in the 48k print buffer. This does not exist at 128k mode. The ZX Spectrum manual says this. In 48 basic mode, all the variables and routines below 5 Charlie 00 hex 23552 do not exist. Instead, there is a buffer between 5 Baker 00 hex 23296 and 5 Charlie 00 hex 23552, which is used for controlling the printer. This is quite a popular location for small machine code routines on the old 48k spectrum. And if any of these routines are tried in plus 3 basic mode, the computer will invariably crash. I've moved all the machine code as requested. I had a few goes at trying to make it crash though, and I had some difficulty just because of blind luck. We don't use 23296. Simon N. Goodwin puts his beat routine at 23500, which is actually in the middle of the T stack used by plus 3 DOS. But my elder routine was at 23400. By loading that after we load the main code, everything was fine. If you load that before the main code, you in fact clobber 
the next program line used by plus three DOS and you get unpredictable results. You either get a hang or a straight up crash 248k basic. The second problem you're going to get is user defined graphics. Because 128k basic has two extra keywords, we had to lose two of the UDGs. This causes problems here because we use every single UDG in the 48k mode and these get spatted on the screen. Two issues, you can move off the screen, this is a bad thing. Also the play command when appears on the screen is black and white, which therefore blocks all movement. The spectrum keyword may also overwrite a battery, which means you can't complete the level. I fixed the UDG problem by moving the U UDG, which was the broken junction, up to the S, the last UDG. We lose two UDGs of the robot animation, which were the robot going up and down neutral, I replace those with just feet together and you can see here it looks fine everything looks okay i'd put some special code in the program to go if it's frame four and you're going up and down then just repeat frame two the third problem is when you exit the program you immediately then crash to 48k basic and lose all the code not to 128k basic this last problem is caused by zip break functionality not working with 128k paging simon n Goodin himself told me how to fix it with a simple poke of 55124 five, with 6. All versions of Runaway Robot will be available on Jim Blimey's website. But now, a word from our sponsor. Well, on the slate. That please, Dave. Aphrodite. Who wants to know? Winkle's the name. Norbert Winkle. Have I got a deal for you? Go on. Compilers for sale, all tested and approved with instruction manual. They're not made in Swansea, are they? No, Arthur. They're not for the dragon. You interested? I think I can spare some cash for compilers. Oi! Paying pants to pirates, not in my manner. You two are coming to help with our inquiries. Crime doesn't pay, kids. But how else could I get hold of the zip compiler? And at competitive price too? Not by coughing up cash to counterfeiters. You need to send moolah to mooly. If only I'd known. Contact Simon N. Gooden at his website. And only £5 in the UK, €6 Euros in Europe, or seven dollars in the rest of the world will get you an authentic manual in the post. As well as an electronic copy of the compiler too. Much cheaper than a donation to the Police Benevolent Fund. So kids, zip along to simon.mooney.org.uk today. And stay out of trouble.